I was invited to address some research and recommendations that relate to suicide prevention and news reporting, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have dialogue, and I hope that, you know, no fist fights break out, but I hope that we ask some hard questions. Um, so to start with, as we know, suicide is not only a wrenching topic, but it is inherently dramatic. As a public health professional, we, do, we always like to start, we give you the background and the methodology, and then eventually we get around to telling you the findings. And journalists, of course, like to cut to the chase. So in the spirit of journalism, here's, here's the whole presentation. There are research-based recommendations, and that the media can provide, provide context, background, and insight. It's more than just the facts, ma'am. But there are some missed opportunities to provide resources for help. What are those resources? Here's the hint, 1-800-273-8255, the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is answered here in Los Angeles by the Dee Dee Hirsch Center. Contagion is what makes suicide a unique topic to report on, unlike any other. It's the process, and those of you who have been here throughout the morning have heard this, but you're going to hear a lot of things repeated because it's important. It's the process by which a vulnerable person can be influenced by another person's suicidal behavior towards suicidal behavior themselves, and the two people do not need to personally know one another. They may be linked only through media exposure. Marilyn Monroe was a media icon glamorized in her life and in her death. And the sensational coverage when she took her life included everything from photos of the bedroom, descriptions of what she was wearing at the time, the number and kind of pills that she took, where exactly her body was found, and so on. And in the 30 days after her death, there was a documented 12% increase in deaths, particularly among women in her age group, using pills. That was about 200 people who would not have died by suicide, so it was a real measurable um, increase. So media contagion is more than just Marilyn Monroe. It's been confirmed by about 50 studies um, in countries around the world. I have a bibliography for anybody who really wants to dig down into the research. Um, and it finds that suicide by readers or viewers can, chain, can increase in the context of the amount the duration and the prominence of the coverage. And at the same time, a couple of studies have shown that changing the way suicide is covered has led to declines, measurable declines, in these copycat deaths. So we can work it both ways. Concerns about contagion in the late 80s helped lead to recommendations here in the US for reporting on suicide. We have copies of these um, in the resources room. They're research-based. They were formed by consensus with input from journalists, um, including uh, journalists on the initial panel and then the Annenberg Public Policy Center, Associated Press Managing Editors, and the National Press Photography Association. They've been nationally disseminated. They've just been translated by our project into Spanish. So our project did a study where we looked at um, newspaper and broadcast television articles covering either suicide events or suicide as a topic in the last six months of 2011 in order to get a baseline so that we can see whether or not our campaign is going to make a difference two years from now. So the, the stories could have been about a death, it could have been about a walk, it could have been about research, and I'm going to highlight um, just six of our findings. So we created a tool to code these stories against the recommendations and then analyzed the results. Would you like to take a guess at what percent of the articles ever gave a mention that there might be a telephone number, an organization, or a website available to help. I guess everybody was here. <laughs> Newspapers, 8%. Television, 2%. Um, and yet they could do a crawl at the bottom of the screen. It would be pretty easy, a little call out box. So it's an easy ask, and there's a lot of uh, room for improvement. The recommendations call to discuss the warning signs and the risk factors, and only about half of the newspaper articles and half of the uh, one quarter of the television broadcasts gave any kind of warning sign or risk factor. And yet, um, when we present suicide as being without warning or as completely inexplicable with no context of risk, 
we're really missing the opportunity to educate and inform. Obesity doesn't occur without contributing factors. Neither does AIDS, not even car crashes, and neither does suicide. A recommendation is that suicide prevention experts can provide advice. And we, sometimes we're not the ones that are getting interviewed. Very few news items interviewed people who had expertise in mental health or suicide prevention. Usually law enforcement, um, which is fine, and sometimes family members or neighbors, again, it's fine. But they can't usually put the death in context or provide this needed information about risks and warning signs, as well as research on treatment. Luckily today, I think we have started training a bunch of you so that you can do a better job um, of making sure that the coverage will adhere to the recommendations. The recommendations call to avoid details about the method. Half of the news items gave these kind of details and a quarter gave too much information <clears throat> about the means used. For example, the exact location where the person could get through the hole in the fence by the railroad track. Um, I think a lot of us now know the exact height of the bridge from which Tony Scott jumped. We didn't used to know how high that bridge was. Do we need to know that? Avoiding sensational language. This is a piece where California media did very, very well, and we were quite pleased. Um, and it really sets the tone. And actually, this was a piece that was difficult for us to analyze because we could look for individual words, but that didn't always tell us what the overall tone or tenor of the article was, especially when we were reading transcripts of television broadcasts. Some of them we could view the whole thing, and then you sometimes get a different impression of what the voice and the body language was like. But given what we could code, things looked pretty good. And the last recommendation, please don't oversimplify. Suicide's very complex, and the media can really give context to suicide. Although most people with mental illness do not die by suicide, most people who die by suicide have an underlying mental illness or a substance use abuse a problem which may or may not have been diagnosed or treated or treated adequately. And then a precipitating event causes a tipping point. Those could be external, like job loss, a physical illness, the loss of a relationship, or it could be something internal, something that causes intense shame or humiliation. And they don't lack the coping, they lack the coping skills to go uh, get support or treatment or to get through this crisis. And often what's publicly known is only one thing, the bankruptcy, the divorce. What isn't publicly known might be that how they felt about it, how much they struggled. So in summary, our baseline study showed that media in California is doing well at using non-sensational language. They could improve with warning signs, risk factors, avoiding the focus on a single cause or event, avoiding those descriptions of method. And there's lots of room for improvement for providing resources and quoting experts in suicide prevention. So in conclusion, coverage can encourage contagion and perpetuate misinformation or it can provide context, background, give insight, and encourage help seeking. That number is 1-800-273-8255. Um, we're going to be repeating this study in 2014, again, looking at six months of coverage, and we look forward to seeing positive changes in reporting, and ideally, fewer suicide deaths and attempts to report on. Thank you very much. <laughs>